Hi, I'm Bill Rapis, the Executive Director of Lymphatic Education and Research Network, and I just want to take this opportunity to thank all of you for joining us today for our symposium series. I also want to take this opportunity to thank all of you who have become members of LEARN and help support this series so that we can continue bringing this kind of groundbreaking information uh, to you in your homes and offices. Uh, I would also suggest for all of you who have not become members of LEARN, $5 a month, you can become a member of LEARN and help support this programming and the research that we do. Thanks very much for joining us and I look forward to having you become a member. I think it's necessary just to give a brief background about lymphatic function and, and lymphedema before we get into um, more about the actual techniques. And I'll be talking also about imaging studies that have uh, improved our understanding of the lymphatic system and how we use that uh, in our workup prior to surgery. So briefly, um, the lymphatic system has been described at times as the sewage system of the body. Basically, fluid that circulates through our uh, arteries and veins can, it can leak out into the tissues. And that's a normal process. And, and that fluid has to then come back into the circulation. And the way it does that is it is collected into lymphatic channels, which are sort of a parallel vascular network um, next to the venous and arterial system. And they pass up towards usually the armpits, the groin, or the cutaneous basins for the skin basins for, for uh, lymphatics from the extremity. But lymphatics are pretty much present throughout the body. And they get the lymphatic fluid gets filtered through lymph nodes. And these lymph nodes basically have high concentrations of immune cells that can help destroy bacteria as well as uh, trap cancer cells. So when a patient with breast cancer uh, enters in for surgery, typically part of that surgical treatment is a sampling of the lymph nodes that drain the breast, which are in the armpit or axilla. And if lymph nodes are involved, with uh, any evidence of tumor cells, then additional lymph nodes are removed for staging and or therapy. And what can happen after that is what we call lymphedema, which is basically swelling in the extremity due to impaired lymphatic clearance. Now, this is not just a problem of having a heavy swollen arm or tightness or discomfort. The issues that can also uh, surround lymphedema include severe infections and recurrent infections, and this problem can become progressive. And in rare cases in long-standing lymphedema, patients can develop a very rare type of cancer, but a very aggressive form of cancer called lymphangiosarcoma. In addition, many patients who undergo lymphatic surgery in the axilla develop a post-mastectomy pain syndrome that can uh, further uh, pardon me, exacerbate their uh, complaints. And this is due to the fact that there are many little nerve fibers in the armpit okay, that traverse the area as well as the brachial plexus that is located just above the axillary vessels. These nerves get cut during surgery. They get trapped in scar tissue. They get radiated. Neuritis can develop over time. And it can be a very um, troubling condition to deal with. And so uh, Joe, my colleague, is going to be speaking about the surgical aspects of the treatment. We'll talk about some of the impact that uh, lymph node transfer may have on this condition as well. So lymphedema. Lymphedema, for anyone who has it, uh, is a very frustrating problem. It's made even more concerning by the fact that it is often a permanent condition and can progress over time. And patients become very anxious about what the future holds. Uh, they may have survived their cancer, they may have been cured of their cancer, but then they're left with this condition that they don't know whether they're gonna be with it for the rest of their lives or whether it's gonna just continue to get worse. And so it's a big problem for them. They go to their physicians. Unfortunately, most physicians have had very little exposure to lymphedema during their medical training. Uh, in the public, their friends, family are probably totally unaware. So it's a very isolating condition. Um, and so we're, uh, we're very focused on making people aware of lymphedema and educating our colleagues about possible treatments. As far as 
the scientific community that knows about lymphedema, even the people that study it are still perplexed by certain factors about lymphedema. We know it's not just simply a blockage in the lymphatic system. If it were, we'd expect the entire arm to blow up as soon as we removed all these lymph nodes. But in fact, what happens is we often see little pockets of lymphedema in the extremity. There may be, as in this picture, just a small area of a patient's hand that is swollen and bothersome. Um, or it can be the whole extremity. It may not develop for a year or more after surgery and sometimes many years later and often after just a minor trauma or something the patient may not even know why uh, the lymphedema starts. But we know that something is happening that is progressive in nature and there's a proliferative component to lymphedema. Uh, the fluid that's in the extremity initially and causes the swelling is sometimes replaced over time by fat and fibrosis, which is basically scar-like tissue in the extremity that makes it very firm and makes it hard to move the fluid out of the extremity. And there are other questions, for example, of why some patients get infections with lymphedema and some patients are relatively spared from infections. There's been a lot of scientific, basic science interest in lymphedema. Uh, Stanley Roxon, who's involved with the Lymphatic Education Research Network, who's done a lot of work looking at markers for lymphedema uh, that can give us insight into what's going on in the, in the patient whose limb is affected by lymphedema. Uh, one of our friends and colleagues up at Memorial, Babak Marara, has looked at mediators of lymphedema in the hopes of hopefully finding a way to manipulate some of the factors that are associated with lymphedema, such as uh, inflammatory mediators like interleukins that might be able to be blocked, or adding factors such as VEGFC or lymphactin, which can promote lymphangiogenesis, the creation of new lymphatics in an extremity that may have been depleted by surgery. Regardless, postmastectomy lymphedema remains a very big problem in the United States. There are 2 million breast cancer survivors. The incidence of lymphedema is estimated at 30 to 50 percent. Some of these patients, it's only temporary, but for many of them, it's a permanent condition. That means up to a million patients with just postmastectomy lymphedema alone. And with almost a quarter of a million new cases annually, this problem is not going to go away anytime soon. As Bill mentioned earlier, it's estimated that there are approximately 10 million people suffering from lymphedema in the U.S. And it's not just from breast cancer. There are patients with a variety of tumors that require lymph node removal, such as pelvic tumors, melanoma, head and neck cancer, uh, and also patients that develop lymphedema for apparently no other reason except that there's something inherently wrong with their lymphatic system, and that's called primary lymphedema. Patients may be born with a swollen extremity or it may de develop at any time during their life, often after some innocuous event such as a, a bug bite or a minor trauma. As Joe mentioned earlier, lipedema is something we're very interested in, and lipedema can also be associated with lymphedema. Uh, it's estimated that 17 million people, primarily women in the U.S., suffer from lipedema. And as you can see in this patient, it, it's, it's a very uh, specific type of swelling that they uh, develop, primarily in the lower extremities, but often sparing the feet, typically sparing the feet. Worldwide, it's estimated that over 120 million people actually suffer from lymphedema, and the most common cause is filariasis, or elephantiasis is, is sort of the, uh, the colloquial phrase for it. But filariasis is a parasitic infection passed on by mosquitoes, to, most often in developing countries. And it's thought that up to over a billion people are at risk for developing this condition worldwide. So treatment for lymphedema has primarily been focused on non-surgical treatment, the mainstay of which for a number of decades has been complete decongestive therapy. And it, is, uh, it consists primarily of manual lymphatic drainage, which is manipulation of the limb to try and move fluid out of the extremity, and compression. And compression is, is an effort to keep that fluid out and also to improve the efficiency of the muscle pumping mechanism that occurs naturally. By wrapping the extremity, the muscle has something to pump against and can help keep the fluid from accumulating in the extremity. And this approach in many patients is extremely effective. 
Many of our therapists do remarkable work uh, in getting fluid out. Um, patients also do this at home. They learn the techniques. They, there are pumps, there are wraps, there are a number of components they, they employ. But for many patients, it's very effective. But it does have some drawbacks. And decongestive therapy is time consuming. And patients with advanced lymphedema spend hours a week um, often hours a day, um, massaging and wrapping in order to control their lymphedema symptoms. For many patients, it's a lifelong endeavor. Um, if they stop, the fluid reaccumulates and their symptoms come back. In addition, patients who are compliant um, often reach a plateau or may actually regress over time as their disease process progresses and the inflammatory and fibrotic changes in the, in the limb progress. And this is because the underlying problem still remains. There is a, 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 a disruption of fluid transport in the extremity, as well as a um, disruption in the immune function of the, the extremity. So how did two plastic surgeons get involved in lymphedema? Um, well, we uh, here at Beth Israel, Joe and myself, are very involved in the cancer program. And we do a lot of microsurgical reconstruction, in particular breast reconstruction. And if you're treating patients with breast cancer, you're going to have patients that show up wearing a sleeve. And invariably, they ask us, is, is there something that can be done for this? Uh, you know, my arm is better, but it's, it's still bothersome. And I wish there was something that could be done. And we've heard this over the years. And finally, we started looking at surgical treatments. So when you look at the surgical options that are available, they can broadly be broken down into two categories. The volume reduction procedures, which consist of excisional procedures or basically cutting out the abnormal tissue and reducing this, the, the, um, the, the volume of the limb, or liposuction, which is used to suction out some of the excess fat that is deposited. And then there are the physiologic procedures, including lymphatic to vein bypass, which basically these procedures are aimed at getting the fluid back into the venous system uh, through some alternate route. And so in lymphatic to vein bypass, you take a lymphatic, a very small lymphatic, and connect it to a very small vein using microsurgery and allow that fluid to flow into the venous system directly. Uh, vascularized lymph node transfer is what we're going to be speaking about this evening. And, and this technique, uh, Joe will elaborate on in more detail, but basically is transferring lymph nodes from an unaffected portion of the body to the depleted portion of the body and reconnecting its blood supply so that these lymph nodes can start functioning again. So what's different now than 20 years ago uh, in lymphatic surgery? Many of the techniques that we're going to talk to you about were around even 20 years ago. I would say the main advance has been in imaging. And this has been true throughout surgery. As imaging has progressed, techniques that were once thought to be marginal or only occasionally successful have been found to be uh, very effective when used in the right setting. And one of the, the problems we had, uh, oh, I was interested in this back when I was a fellow about 17 years ago. I remember using isosulfan blue for um, injecting lymphatics, looking for uh, uh, lymphatics to bypass to veins. And it was very hard to see the lymphatics. And often in a swollen limb, in, this, in a thin limb like this, you might see some lymphatics in the skin. But in a swollen limb, it could be very difficult to see these lymphatics. And so you wouldn't know what you were going to find until you were in the operating room. And often you didn't find anything. So fast forward to the last several years, and indesigning green imaging using a near-infrared laser has totally transformed lymphatic surgery. With this type of imaging, we can actually see through the skin and fluoresce the dye within the lymphatic channels. And we can see what's going on in real time. And so with the spy system that we have in our office, patients can see this before surgery. A physical therapist can come in and manipulate the limb and see what's happening to the fluid in that extremity. Is it moving out? Is it just building up as they push it along or you know is it is there even any functioning lymphatic channels in that arm we can see this with the spy imaging now we use a number of different um, imaging studies uh, to assess patients prior to surgery 
and we do this in a in a sort of multidisciplinary fashion. We have our nuclear medicine colleagues, Dr. Goldfarb and Dr. An Singh. I'm not sure if they're here this evening. Uh, they are. Uh, have been working diligently with us to develop protocols to image our patients so that we can get a, a, a real understanding first of the diagnosis, do they have lymphedema, and then also to assess them postoperatively, see what's happening in terms of their deep lymphatic structures. I've also worked very closely with our radiology colleagues, Dr. Kagan's here, who has worked uh, is worked with us for a number of years on projects developing protocols, specialized imaging protocols using MRI. Uh, to image various structures in the body. We've recently added MR lymphangiography to our uh, protocol. This allows us to actually get a very detailed image of the lymphatic structures in the extremity, something that we can't necessarily see on a uh, lymphocentigraphy. We can see on MR lymphangiography. In addition, MR angiography, which involves injecting dye into the vascular system, allows us to discern the amount of fluid and the amount of fat that's in the lymphedematous limb. And that's important for us to know because if we're going to be intervening, we have to know what we're actually trying to get out of that limb. Is it going to be primarily fat that we have to address, in which case perhaps liposuction might be a better option, or is it fluid, in which case a physiologic procedure might be more effective. And you can see on the, the lymphedematous limb here, the amount of that black uh, substance outside of the, the muscle, which is the central dark area, is all fluid in that limb. But you can also see the accumulation of excess fat in that limb as well. So if you get the fluid out, you may still have some fat that needs to be addressed. Other things that we found on our imaging include um, abnormalities in the, the venous system. And this is an important consideration for us because there are only two ways that fluid can get out of the limb. One is through the veins and one is through the lymphatics. And so if the lymphatics are disrupted and the vein is constricted, it's going to be very difficult for that patient to get the fluid out and for a therapist to get the fluid out. There's going to be a lot of buildup and no way for the, that um, fluid to go anywhere. So at the time of surgery, if we see something like this on a preoperative imaging study, we can go in and address that. We can cut out all that scar, release the vein, and allow that vein to expand. And that will hopefully, hopefully lower the venous pressure and help decrease the amount of fluid that accumulates in the limb. Perhaps one of the most important components of our imaging workup has been in identifying the location of lymph nodes. And in particular, uh, it started with the groin lymph nodes because this is the sort of the standard donor site for axillary reconstruction with lymph nodes. Uh, many surgeons take the lymph nodes from the groin. You'll see in all these diagrams that there's a line marking out where the crease is in the groin. And many people are, har these are all from scientific articles showing that the lymph nodes are being harvested below that groin crease or right at the groin crease. Well, in our experience with our cancer patients, we realize that a lot of the lymph nodes are actually above the groin crease and that we, were, we had some concerns about taking lymph nodes below the groin crease. And so we started looking at our MRs. We have hundreds of MRIs from our patients that we've operated on. And so in conjunction with Dr. Kagan um, and Dr. Erez Dayan, who's one of our uh, residents here, uh, we did a, an extensive study. And Erez really did the lion's share of, of, of analysis on these MRs to to figure out in a three-dimensional fashion where they're located. And what we found was that the lymph nodes that drain the abdomen were actually above the groin crease, and that lymph nodes that were below the groin crease primarily drained the lower extremity, and often were the ones that lit up when they, one did sentinel, uh, sentinel node mapping, which is basically injecting the lower extremity with a dye or, a, or technetium to see where the fluid drains to. And if you remove a sentinel lymph node, you're disrupting the, 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 the fluid egress from the lower leg. So after mapping these 2,000 lymph nodes, we came up with a map of the anatomy and where to harvest these nodes. And this was just published last month in the, in the Journal of Reconstructive Microsurgery. So if you look at where people have harvested these lymph nodes in the past and where we've sort of rec been recommending that they be harvested, you can see there's a difference. That in this lower diagram, the lymph nodes are actually well above the crease, and that below the crease, 
is the sentinel node, right in the area where many other people have been harvesting them in the past. And I think this is something that's changed. We've talked to some colleagues, and they've changed the way they've harvested these lymph nodes in order to avoid the risk of lymphedema. And Joe's going to talk more about another technique that combines this with our spy imaging called reverse lymphatic mapping that really ups the safety of, of lymph node harvest. There's been a number of uh, papers that just came out looking at uh, lymphedema after sentinel node biopsy in the lower extremity. This paper from last year showed a 35% incidence of removing in patients that just had two or three lymph nodes removed, but these were sentinel nodes from the lower extremity, those nodes that we said we were trying to avoid. 35% incidence of lymphedema and 23% incidence of lymphedema that persisted beyond a year. And in the plastic surgery literature, in patients who are undergoing lymph node transfer from the groin, a number of articles have come out over the last year also showing uh, abnormalities in lymphatic drainage and lymphedema after lymph node transfer. And again, one of the reasons that we've been going out and speaking at all these conferences is that we found this technique to be extremely valuable for us uh, in terms of uh, understanding which lymph nodes to take. So the SPY system will show us up front you can see the difference. This is a foot, but you can see it below a foot with lymphedema and a normal appearing foot above where the lymphatics are sort of a, a very delicate um, network of channels uh, pulsating and, and transmitting fluid. This video actually shows a patient pre-op above and below the same foot after a lymph node transfer. And let's see if I can point out here that this is a flap and this here is a lymphatic that's now functioning and propulsing and passing fluid up towards this flap that's been placed on the lower extremity. And this is the type of imaging that we can get in the operating room and postoperatively in our office that really lets us know what's happening. And you know, for us, this was a remarkable uh, image. And um, Joe's going to share some more findings that we've uh, collected over the past year. But um, this is the power of the SPY system, and it's uh, something that I think we're going to take a moment to demonstrate. Uh, and, and are we set up to do that? Uh, we'll demonstrate that momentarily. And this just shows the SPY intraoperatively just how we confirm uh, that our flaps are viable, that this area here is a lymph node flap being connected by blood vessels into the armpit. And here, with an intravenous injection of the indocyanine green, we can see the blood vessels light up as the blood passes in and out of the flap, and the flap begins to glow. That's how we know that this flap is functioning and well vascularized, even though these vessels may only be a millimeter or millimeter and a half in diameter. This tissue can live on those, on those small vessels. So I think um, uh, you want to get set up for the injection. Uh, we're going to get set up. We're actually going to use uh, Dr. Diane as a, as a guinea pig for the moment. Um, <laughs> uh, we're going to inject him with some indocyanin green so that we could show a live example of, uh, of the lymphatic imaging. I'll just say that one other thing in terms of our um, analysis of patients and our outcomes. We, you know, many people use limb circumference as a way of evaluating outcomes. And one, one of the things that we found is that this is a very difficult measurement to use consistently because there are so many variables that affect it. And we've seen, we've seen amazing results without surgery with just compression where limb circumference can go down remarkably. You can see a patient on a hot day and their limb swells up, they get off a plane, it's swollen, they've been exercising and it gets a little swollen. I mean, there's so many things that can affect limb circumference that we have found this to be a moving target. We do use it, but we also try to use all the other modalities we have, which are our imaging studies, as well as quality of life questionnaires, an assessment of pain, the need for compression, and the incidence of cellulitis. And I think this is an important thing going forward for us and for anybody interested in lymphedema research that's looking at it on a clinical level to follow, um, because we need more ways of assessing uh, our interventions. So are we set up now? OK, great. This is going to hurt you, Joe, more than it hurts me. <laughs> so, 
just to reiterate, we don't uh, we don't own stock. We don't get any royalties from Spy. I know we're talking about it a lot. I don't any I don't own any stock at all anyway. But um, the Spy really, in order to operate for a surgeon, you need to see, and the Spy lets us see. And I think that's um, this may be a huge. Um, not only a diagnostic tool, but also research tool, and will help. It help. It already helps us guide our surgery, as I'll show you in, in the operating room. So um, these technologies um, are really big advances, and you'll be able to see what, or I'll be able to see what's happening with my lymphatic system, um, and it's actually incredibly sensitive, even if you don't have swelling and you have subclinical lymphedema, meaning the lymphatic system's not 100%, but you actually don't have a swollen limb, the spy is so sensitive it can actually pick that up. And so it's, a va it's been a very valuable tool for us. Um, and we're seeing patterns in lymphedema. We're not just, we don't just have surgery on the brain. We really un want to understand what's going on. So. You want to do a little hand MLD? <laughs> the therapists don't judge us on this. We're, we're amateurs. But, yeah. but you can see it moving up the arm here. And that's a normal lymphatic, Joe. <laughs> You're doing well. But anyway, this has been very valuable because if someone who has lymphedema, we, we'll see uh, various patterns of, um, of extravasation that can give us an idea of the severity of the lymphatic uh, dysfunction. And we can also um, look at potential areas where the lymphedema is, is more prevalent. It may not always be so easy to tell in a, in a limb. Um, but you can see localized areas of lymphedema within an extremity, and we may target those areas in certain situations for lymph node transfer. Okay. That's great, Joe. Thanks. Yes, I think he deserves a hand for that. <laughs> All in the name of science. But I do want to step back and just just to put everything in perspective because lymph node transfer is not standard. It's not everywhere. A lot of people have never heard of it. Um, people have questions about it. Some people have very strong feelings for or against it. But the fact of the matter is, is that up until recently, there hasn't been a whole lot of science to base any feeling or position on. Um, and my first exposure was during my fellowship with Mingwei Chen. Um, at Changgung, a uh, huge microsurgery center. They're uh, tremendous innovators, um, and he really has a scientific mind. And I saw these patients, did these surgeries, and was very intrigued, but at the same time skeptical and had the same questions that many people had. Um, and then quickly realized in a very humbling moment that no matter what I thought, I had very little background to make any conclusions because I probably spent a half an hour on the lymphatic system in medical school, had not really in interacted with almost any patients with lymphedema to any significant de degree in my entire residency. And so everything I knew about lymphedema was really very simple. Very simple. And the more, the more uh, Dr. Smith and I actually investigated the literature in terms of surgery and lymphedema, very little was out there. So we were starting really um, trying to see everything with our very own eyes and really thinking out this whole process. Uh, there was limited published data, and mainly I was, does this work? How does it work? And is this safe? Is it, is it insane to take lymph nodes from one part of your body and put them somewhere else? After all, that's why many of these patients have lymphedema. They had axillary dissections. Why in the world would you do that? And so, um, 
there's an answer and we're getting we'll get there very quickly but basically there's a need for a scientific approach to lymphatic surgery um, and that's that's well recognized and that's changing a lot um, so the number one thing for us was safety as it as it is for all of our patients our main concern was causing a problem causing lymphedema making the patient worse god forbid and i i think um, this is where everything starts at the same time um, at some point we're going to be at the point of the unknown it's just a fact that if you're developing or pioneering a field there's nobody that has the answer there's always going to be a first there's always going to be a second there's no way to answer all the questions if it's never really been done and you can't evolve you can't progress without taking that on and that's just a fact that we have to accept um, both Dr. Smith and I really wanted to understand lymphedema itself. And this all started in the library. There, I guess there are no libraries. They're online now. Um, and careful evaluation, every single patient we saw, we took them as a, we took that opportunity to really study their lymphedema. We didn't see a patient with just a swollen limb. When you look closely, everybody's a little different. Some people have their hands spared. Some people have the whole arm. Some people have pitting, non-pitting. But what does that actually mean? Even the classification of lymphedema today is kind of, it's antiquated. We say class one, class two, there are a no number of classifications, but basically they're based on, on a physical exam. If there's pitting, if there's no pitting, if it gets better with elevation, if it doesn't, or if their skin changes, but what does that actually mean, and how does that impact our therapy? Nobody would classify cancer today. Everybody here that's had breast cancer-related lymphedema, when they were worked up, you wouldn't go to a doctor. They give you a physical exam and say, uh, this is your breast cancer. You get imaging. There are biopsies. We have technology to really work up every disease process, but for some reason in lymphedema, we don't. And that's changing. The SPI, lymphocentigraphy, MR, is all changing that. So it's an exciting time. Um, meticulous rep record keeping. Um, Mark and I, from the beginning, have, have um, dedicated ourselves for prospective data collection. That means that we're going to see, we're going to do these studies the same exact way, the MR, the lymphocentigraphy, everything the same standardized way, so it's not comparing apples and oranges. We really didn't see much of this. So just getting right into vascularized lymph node transfer, um, I, it's great to see um, uh, some of our patients here. It really means a lot to us. Um, and of course, you're, you're more familiar than anybody of what this is. But for those of you who are not familiar, it's basically t transfer, transplanting lymph nodes from one part of your body that can take that can uh, do without them to another part of your body that needs them. We're basically replacing what was removed. There were lymph nodes removed in the axilla. Um, there's a problem with fluid getting out, and we're replacing what was removed. It's not a terribly um, earth-shattering concept, but but there's a lot of there's been a lot of resistance to it initially. But after you think about it, it starts to make sense. Um, how do you do that? You can't just cut out lymph nodes and stick them somewhere. It's like putting them on a kitchen counter. They're not going to survive. They need a blood supply with circulation and oxygen. And that's where microsurgery comes in. So microsurgery is just sewing an artery and vein together to the artery and vein um, that's attached to the lymph nodes so that you can reestablish you can reestablish uh, blood flow to those lymph nodes and they stay alive. These, uh, these uh, blood vessels are only about a millimeter or a millimeter and a half. This is a groin. This is a packet of lymph nodes. And this is an artery and a vein, probably 1.2 millimeters or something. Uh, very small. We do this under a microscope. It's very delicate surgery. But it's not big invasive surgery. It's basically fat. So we're not diving into deep organs. Where do we get these lymph nodes? We can get them from the groin. We can get them from under the arm. We can get them from the neck and also from inside the abdomen called the omentum, which is less, uh, much less popular. But basically, most of our experience has been in, in these sites. So how does a lymph node transfer work? This is, a, this is something that um, we've pieced we've taken pieces together and this is really um, actually coming to light this year. 
the first thing is, is does do lymphatic vessels actually find their way into these lymph nodes? So we transplant the lymph nodes in the, in the, in your axilla or in your upper limb. Are lymphatic vessels actually going to find their way to these lymph nodes? Back in 1997, uh, Dr. Sumner Slavin in Boston, um, one of our colleagues had shown that lymphatic vessels actually grow across a scar. Um, and this was confirmed by lymphocentigraphy. So that actually happens. And then Dahlia Tobaya, who did some basic science large animal research on a sheep, where they did a lymph node transfer. This is a lymph node in a sheep. Um, they just hooked up a blood, the artery in the vein. They didn't make any of these connections. These are lymphatics that three months later they found growing into the lymph node. So both lymphatics um, coming, coming into the node and lymphatics going out of the lymph node, they found their way. These lymph nodes are, find, are found to have VEGFC or growth factor that um, causes ingrowth of lymphatic vessels. And then in our own patients, using the SPI, we're actually able to see this is a patient at a lymph node transfer to the wrist. This dye was injected in my hand just like she had. And here's a lymphatic vessel that found its way into the lymph nodes. So that confirms that that, that lymph, lymphatics are actually growing into these transferred lymph nodes in our own patients. Um, this is a very powerful tool. But there are two kind of theories. Um, is this a bridge or is it a bypass? And what I mean by that is that if somebody removes your lymph nodes from your axilla, um, there's basically a gap. And when we put these lymph nodes in there, is this just bridging the gap and restoring that continuity of the lymphatic system? Or is it working by a different way? Um, a shunt, a bypass, meaning that um, is this sucking lymph or sucking fluid and then, and then basically dumping it into, the ve into your veins and bypassing the whole lymphatic blockage? And we've seen evidence actually for both. So, how, do, how would that work, this shunt? Well, in the, lymphat in the actual lymph nodes, um, there are little connections between lymphatic vessels and veins. Um, that's how, after all, uh, T cells, immune cells, get into the lymph node from your circ circulation is because there's a communication. And all of us have a massive lymphatic venous connection in our bodies. Um, the thoracic duct is basically a huge tube that collects all the lymphatics from your from your legs and your left upper extremity and and plugs and it plugs right in into one of the large veins that um, go into your heart so it brings lymph and it puts it back into your circulation so at the level of the lymph node there are these tiny little shunts tiny little interconnections and so lymph node transfer um, and this was recent work shown by Ming Wei Chen at the American Society of Plastic Surgery and will be published soon has been shown to um, suck fluid and push it out the vein and basically take the path of least resistance. And I'm just expounding on what Dr. Smith spoke about earlier, but um, our understanding of lymphatic anatomy and lymph node anatomy itself has changed the way we see. I, I used to, in, in residency, see lymph nodes as something that you remove after cancer treatment, that the groin nodes are just a packet of nodes that drain the leg, and the, the axillary nodes are a packet of nodes that drain the arm and the breast. But it's not like that. It's, there's a more sophisticated um, way they work. Some, some lymph nodes in, that, in the groin drain the leg. Some lymph nodes drain the genital region. Some lymph nodes drain the lower abdomen. Some lymph nodes drain the buttock. And the more you look at it and the more sophisticated you think about this, the more you recognize that our basic understanding, even from a surgical perspective, in residency is, is, quite, is quite limited. Um, we found out that, as Dr. Smith showed, lymph nodes down here are draining the leg, which we can stay away from. Lymph nodes up here are draining the lower abdomen. And this is really what's called translational research, where we, we do research, we study it, and it directly affects how we treat a patient and improves patient care. So we went from the MRA studies and the MRAs, thanks to Alex Kagan, to our publication defining exactly where these lymph nodes are to a patient on the table where we can make the surgery um, safe. We do these together. Dr. Smith and I um, do all of these surgeries together. And it allow having two brains in the operating room and four eyes allows us to really collaborate and, um, 
and increase our our experience quite rapidly. I apologize. Some of the some of the um, pictures I'm going to show are a little graphic. If this is the time to maybe turn away, I know most of those of you that have survived breast cancer are tougher than most of us, so I'm sure that you're okay with this. Anybody who is a little squeamish might might want to close their eyes. But this is basically, this is the patient on the table where we transfer our knowledge of anatomy and harvest the lymph nodes that we want in a precise way. So one question is, is this procedure safe? Can you cause lymphedema? Um, the answer is for any surgical procedure, there is risk. And there's absolutely a risk of causing lymphedema. How, however, the question is how much, how much of a risk? And how can we, ma how can we minimize that risk? Um, and that really comes down to reverse lymphatic mapping. Reverse lymphatic mapping allows us to selectively isolate lymph nodes that drain the trunk and differentiate those that drain the upper limb. Um, and we've seen publications that um, have not used reverse lymphatic mapping or these techniques. Um, this is really what stimulated all of this work. This is over the past three years. Um, we've now are studying the sites of uh, the donor sites for lymph node transfer. We have not seen any donor site lymphedema to date. Reverse lymphatic mapping is a simple concept originated by Dr. Suzanne Klimberg, a breast surgeon who's really um, a forerunner in trying to rev trying to minimize causing any lymphedema during an axillary dissection or sentinel lymph node biopsy. And her basic concept was to inject blue dye into the upper limb and inject a radioisotope technetium, which is standard, into the breast. And this way, avoiding the blue nodes would theoretically avoid the upper limb, the lymph nodes draining the upper limb. And she's been able to successfully uh, drastically minimize any lymphedema after, after um, that procedure. We took this concept and modified it and applied it to, and really are the first to apply it to vascularized lymph node transfer. We had this idea to develop this technique, and basically we use endocyanine green, which is the green dye that um, Dr. Smith just injected into me. We inject that uh, into the lower abdomen if we're taking groin lymph nodes. The morning of surgery, we'll inject technetium into the foot. This way in the operating room, technetiums are low-level radioactive isotope. It's commonly used in all sentinel lymph node biopsies. Um, but in the operating room, we have a gamma probe, which is like a Geiger counter, and we can it makes a loud sound whenever you're near the lymph nodes draining the lower limb. So we have, we have like a guidance system while we're doing surgery throughout the whole case, and we can cherry pick which lymph nodes are just draining the abdomen, which we can take safely. Um, and this is this is um, an example of that. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna just put this on mute. But I'm injecting the same dye that was just injected into my hands here in the lower abdomen. And we have this machine, the spy machine, in the operating room. And you'll see you'll see here lymphatic vessels. These are the injection sites, and you'll see the lymphatic vessels draining into lymph nodes. These are the lymph nodes draining the lower abdomen, and we can harvest safely. Um, now, this is going to be a little loud, but so that's the um, that's the gamma probe, the Geiger counter, and and you can see these are the lymph nodes draining the draining the groin. So we have we then get a map in the operating room. Here's the lymph node draining the lower extremity. Here are the lymph nodes draining the lower abdomen. So it's not just a bunch of groin groin lymph nodes. And applying scientific literature from lymph node dissections for melanoma or radical lymphadenectomies to lymph node transfer is not 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 valid. It's not the same thing. This is a much more precise and limited uh, harvest. So. Um, this we also do in the upper limb. You can see our maps here. Um, here are these endocyanine green injections in the chest, and the patient had a technetium injected into the hand when we're going under the arm. And this is an example of, um, of lymphatic mapping, reverse lymphatic mapping as we call it, using the spy. 
here are the injections, and here are, um, here are the lymphatics draining the lymph nodes. And likewise, so these are our lymph nodes we harvested that have almost no uptake. And you can see we've left, we've left the lymph nodes um, in the arm, in the axilla that drain the upper limb where they're supposed to be. So we haven't taken anything that contributes to drainage of the upper limb. And we also confirm uh, that there's actual, here's a blood vessel pumping into our lymph nodes after we hooked up the blood vessels under the microscope. So we can go in, we just want to go walk in quietly with as, limit, with as limited um, minimal risk as possible. And then these are our numbers. So we actually quantify how much how much um, uptake of technetium is in the node. So we'll take a 10 second count, basically measuring how much uh, signal we get in 10 seconds and, um, from the lymph nodes we harvest and how much signal we get in 10 seconds from those lymph nodes draining the extremity. And you can see there's a wide difference between the lymph nodes, the red are the bars of the signal draining the lower extremity or upper extremity, and the blue is the signal we get in the lymph node flaps, where there's a there's a big, a big difference. So, um, just going back to our first case, those of you that have seen this um, before are familiar. Um, this is a very uh, we owe a lot to this uh, patient um, who's been very generous and open sharing her experience but she had breast cancer-related lymphedema, had radiation, mastectomy, and lymphedema for five years, did everything right, 24-7 compression, but still had three major episodes of cellulitis, um, had a house in North Carolina with mosquitoes and the heat, couldn't enjoy the house, was an avid golfer, couldn't do 18 holes of golf, flew frequently for business, could not really fly without tremendously exacerbating her lymphedema. This really interrupted her life. I mean, it, it, her life stopped, not after breast cancer, but after she developed lymphedema. And, and that's what really prompted her to explore surgery. And it ultimately became a, a, a decision between what's the risk of doing nothing and what's the risk of doing surgery. Um, and I just want to point out, as, as Dr. Smith said, before and after photos are not are misleading. And I'll tell you, take the before and after photos even in this symposium with a grain of salt. Um, the most, because if somebody's wrapping really tightly and you take a before and after photo, but they weren't wrapping much before surgery, it's not a valid comparison because the physical therapist actually actually did the work. The most compelling, um, the most compelling results are a before and after photo where the patient stops wrapping. Because then, um, in a patient like this who is doing 24-7 compression and then is no, longer, is no longer wrapping 24 hours a day, only once in a while, and has a smaller limb, that's the most compelling result for a true result in lymphedema. So when even I read studies about surgery or a medical intervention and we see before and after limb circumferences, Without knowing if they were wrapping before surgery or if they were taking extra good care after surgery, you really don't know. What matters is long-term results. And this patient is now, um, this is a two-year post-op, and she's still getting better. She had actually lymph node transfer to the wrist and a lymph node transfer to the axilla. Um, she really enjoys life without uh, interruption. She's golfing. She's flying. In fact, the last time she flew over here, she didn't even wear a compression sleeve on the plane, which was unthinkable. And, um, you know. And I also have a el have an elbow. I didn't realize I had one of those either on my right arm. So it's not just enough to, to have a patient that's, that's satisfied or have a subjective improvement. We really need to show data. We need to show that this actually did something. And how do we show that? One is by MRA showing these lymph nodes um, were actually active. So Dr. Kagan right here injects a IV contrast. And if these light up, that means they've got a blood supply and they're actually alive and had identified five viable lymph nodes transferred in this patient. This is the same patient that underwent the surgery. And this is um, lymphocentigraphy. 
Um, Dr. Goldfarb had injected this patient in the hand, and you can see one, two, three, four, five viable lymph nodes. These lymph nodes, uh, the dye got into those lymph nodes. They weren't injected directly. It was injected into the hand and found their way into the lymph nodes. So these lymph nodes have changed the physiology of this patient's arm. They're actually functioning. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> Which is even better. So um, this, is, this is a lovely person who underwent lymph node transfer to the axilla for breast cancer-related lymphedema. She was not really able to put on her wedding ring and now consistently puts it on, and it's pretty loose. But again, uh, the data is important. So lymphocentigraphy before surgery, this is the same patient showed on the normal side, you can see she had, she had an injection of technetium into both hands. Nothing lights up on the left. On the right side, you can see a lymph node. You can see a couple lymph nodes. Um, one year post-op, she had technetium injection in both hands. On the right side, we see the same lymph nodes. But on the left, we see our lymph node that we transferred. So that dye found itself all the way from the web space of the hand all the way up to the axilla. So this is a lymph node that is pulling fluid throughout the entire arm. This is, this is irrefutable data. You can't really argue with a physiologic functional, functional um, result. And these are other results. A lymph node transfer is typically not a cure. Uh, there shouldn't be mythology about lymph node transfer and what it does and doesn't do. Some patients do get close to a cure or maybe a clinical cure, but most have an improvement, a significant improvement. Um, this is four months post-op of one patient. This is a very early post-op um, of another patient. You can see the hand was always puffy, very, very compliant, did everything right, did all the therapy, um, but the therapist wasn't able to get that fluid out because there was just no way out. And so after the lymph node transfer, even after an early time, there's um, improvement. Um, some severe cases, uh, long-standing lymphedema we've done, 25 years, radical, radical, um, uh, radical mastectomy. Um, breast cancer-related lymphedema is more than just lymphedema. There's, uh, as Dr. Smith said, there's a constellation of pain symptoms, discomfort, and also restricted range of motion in some patients such as this. Uh, this is really a very, very difficult and technically challenging operation. All of this scar has to be removed. This is the brachial plexus, which is, uh, I always thought, a cool-sounding name, but it's basically the fuse box for all the nerves that run and wire your entire upper extremity, your hands, your hands, forearm, upper arm. And um, all of this is very delicate microsurgery, so you have to be comfortable operating these areas. But um, six-month post-op result is just a different arm. Um, never smiled before surgery now looks forward to coming to the office, and is really one of the most satisfying things we're doing, and um, improved range of motion, almost, almost normal. And on MR, uh, significant improvement. The market already showed this. But um, this is not breast cancer-related lymphedema, but it's on a gentleman who's had um, squamous cell carcinoma in the axilla and basically had an axillary dissection with radiation and a rapidly swelling limb. This was getting bigger and bigger um, and almost limb-threatening and very early post-op result thanks to, um, I believe, Sandy Shine had done his um, PT, which took a long time, but was able to push fluid out, out of the limb because there was just no, nowhere to go before. Um, and this is also this li limited range of motion, and this was a patient who had a compressed axillary vein. So a lymph node transfer is not going to work if the vein is compressed because it's trying to push fluid through the path of least resistance. So that pre-op imaging that Dr. Smith showed is, comes very key and allows us to plan the surgery well. So in this patient, we saw this highly compressed vein. We're able to go in there 
and actually here's the axillary vein and remove and totally remove all the scar and the vein just dilates it just dilates up it's incredibly satisfying and you now have a low pressure outlet for the lymph node transfer to work and and also an improved range of motion um, which cannot be underestimated just to show you we've done this for cancer related lower extremity lymphedema, ovarian, cervical, uterine cancers, radical hysterectomies, and radiation, um, basically replacing what's been lost. We typically transplant the lymph nodes behind the calf. And um, um, part of my leg, my foot is, um, this is amazing because for 10 years I haven't seen the, um, the bone structure of my foot. So to be able to see my ankle is somewhat of a miracle, really. And um, these are, the reason we keep doing this is because we see, we see it working. And we, wanted, we want to be, we want to collaborate with basic science researchers, with therapists, with surgical oncologists, with all of our colleagues, um, and our colleagues doing lymph node transfer and other types of lymphatic surgery, because at the end of the day, it's all about uh, the patients. It's all about you. It's all about trying to do a better job. And a lot of patients with lymphedema have been neglected, and so it becomes a particularly satisfying field in medicine, because you're, you're getting involved in an area where a lot of patients are coming to you where they felt there was really they were kind of getting pushed away because nobody had an answer. And so that's really what drives us to this, to this field. Um, what are the indications of, of lymph node transfer? Um, my, we treated mild to severe lymphedema. Um, I think breast cancer-related lymphedema is, is, in general, a very good indication if the patient is motivated for surgery to the point where dealing with it bothers them. Um, usually, concern of progression um, infections, the worry of having to deal with it all the time and that it never gets better is really what will um, be a determining factor. Um, any problems with the veins need to be addressed. And in some patients, um, based on pre-op imaging, we can assess that if that's going to be an issue or not. Um, these days, for a straightforward lymph node transfer, not everybody's straightforward. Some people have very severe axillary scar and need a much more involved surgery. But for a straightforward lymph node transfer, um, it's now become an overnight hospital stay for most. Um, for more difficult cases, and everybody's different, can be much longer. Um, physiotherapy is part of this. This is not a, and this is not a substitute for therapy. Um, all of our patients see lymphedema therapist or must see lymphedema therapist beforehand as well as afterward, and we coordinate closely with the therapist, and we gain a lot of insight from the therapist. They're, they're on your limb more than anybody. And um, with that, I just wanted to thank, thank you all for your attention. If there are any questions in the audience, I think Joe and I would be uh, happy to answer them from the audience or from our um, live stream viewers. Yes. So in case uh, you can't hear, uh, the question was whether um, improvement in the range of motion after surgery may contribute to the improvement in uh, lymphatic drainage. And certainly we know that exercise um, is helpful for lymphedema. And um, part of the idea of compression is to facilitate the movement of fluid out of the limb through muscle function and contraction against the compression. Um, the ability to elevate an arm should be helpful, but unless you're walking around with your arm over your head, <laughs> that's probably not a big contributing factor. But I think the scar release in and of itself, uh, as I mentioned with Charmaine's case, I think, you, you know, Susan, you had a tremendous amount of scar in there. It's surprising that anything could get out of there. And I think releasing that, there's the venous component that we mentioned. There's a lymphatic component in terms of just releasing the scar and also the, the fact that there are lymph nodes in there. And I think all of these factors together uh, contribute to that. Um, Joe, do you have any other comments on that?
think I think you answered. I mean, perfectly. Um, I do think the motion allowing you to be able to range the arm range of motion is is important in reducing in reducing lymphedema. We've seen patients that have had basically had even worse frozen shoulder and rapidly progressing lymphedema. And part of the reason is that their arm is always dependent and gravity is always working against them. It was also a bit scary. It was a bit scary. <laughs> I think, um, you know, a lot of, like Susan pointed out, planning ahead of time, um, having all this imaging before surgery made this a very comfortable surgery for us. Actually, we kind of sailed sailed right through. I think the biggest issue for a surgeon is not being able to know ahead of time what's going on, not being able to see. And so all of this lymphatic imaging um, has really, really made surgery very comfortable and easy, generally. Yes. Um, that's actually been, by in some groups, it, it actually is. Um, you know, I think there are a lot of the movement of, of what you're talking about. I would credit Suzanne Klimberg. I know there are a lot of other people I should probably be crediting, but um, she is sort of foremost in the literature and speaking with her um, in, in using uh, reverse mapping to try to avoid lymphedema. There are some... Uh, practitioners that are using the SPI to do a lymph node dissection or to do a sentinel lymph node biopsy because it does it does allow you to see better. And so I think that's an evolution. It's a big point, important point you bring up. The actual treatment of breast cancer, the way the axillary dissection is done can minimize lymphedema or, or avoid it in the first place. And totally agree. Yes. Actually, Tina had one, but another patient of ours actually did have two that were done at different time points. That was the first patient that we showed, and um, she had had uh, lymphedema throughout the extremity, and with the distal lymph node transfer, there was improvement primarily distally in the arm, but there was still some lymphedema proximally, and so with the second lymph node transfer, there was an improvement in, in that proximal lymphedema. I just wanted to also add that M Mark and I don't work in a vacuum, that we work closely with the surgical oncologists and in particularly with our breast cancer surgeons um, here at Beth Israel, St. Luke's Roosevelt, where I think our activity in lymphedema has made um, everyone we work with particularly sensitive and aware of the lymphatic system and really approaching the axilla in a sophisticated way. And so I think we're very lucky to have them. I know some of, I know Dr. Gallego's here, and I think Dr. Kate, is Dr. Kate here? But I think we have some of our breast surgeons here and just wanted to um, highlight them. Um, we do have a few questions from our live stream viewers that um, we'd like to uh, acknowledge and address here. Um, there's a question. Uh, it says, with your revised surgical approach, um, have any patients experienced donor site lymphedema? And uh, I think they're referring to the reverse lymphatic mapping. Um, we've not seen anybody who's had uh, donor site lymphedema uh, at this point. And we're, you know, for us, the, the real proof is in the pudding in terms of our post-operative um, measurements uh, at one year, and that's what we're really looking at for uh, to confirm all of our results. Uh, doing MR uh, imaging, uh, lymphocentigraphy, uh, limb measurements, uh, and the other uh, outcome measures that we we showed. So, uh, we're a lot of this data started uh, approximately three years ago, and is starting to accrue now. And part of the mission of this center is to really formally evaluate every single patient that comes through 
prospectively and to get this follow-up data. And we really have been very careful in terms of putting out data prematurely. And so we're, what we've seen to date is not any lymphedema, but we're going to, we want to confirm that with all our imaging studies before we say that, you know, there's no changes because even subtle changes can sometimes uh, escape clinical exam. So we're trying to make sure that even in terms of subclinical edema that we're not seeing that, or if, it, if we are, we need to be aware of that and see if there's anything that we can do to modify that. I would, I would also add that it doesn't exist in the real world any type of surgery with zero risk and 100% effectiveness. It just doesn't. I wish it did. I wish we could practice lymph node transfer or breast reconstruction or anything in surgery with zero risk and 100% effect. So I do want to just bring everything to a real, realistic level. Um, I mean, I had surgery for horrible reflux. I was quietly um, suffering with terrible burning constantly that's going to be lifelong and permanent and I was taking pills and at some point I couldn't take it anymore nobody knew I was suffering um, but I went and had this surgery where they wrap your stomach around your esophagus where 20 years ago if you had such a surgery it, it sounded horrible and just like lymph node transfer one of the, some of these surgical procedures 20 years ago had no effect or horrible results and then I looked at the literature and the literature was terrible the data on Nissen fundoplication which is a mouthful which what this was called was not very good there were some bad results there were some horrible complications I went to my surgeon who was the chairman of surgery Steve Evans who I'm forever grateful to and I said what's going on I looked this up I'm in medicine it looks like a bad surgery these people failed and the problem is is that this was applied to everybody and not everybody that had the surgery should have gotten the surgery um, and it comes down to an individual evaluation and ultimately a measured ass assessment of what's the risk am I gonna live with this for the rest of my life um, am I gonna take pills for the rest of my life this is only gonna get worse I'm only this age and I, I knew there were potential complications with any surgery so I don't think um, when a discussion occurs about lymphatic surgery any surgeon should say uh, this works in everybody and every surgeon should say that there's absolutely no risk but um, our goal is to minimize the risk make this as safe as possible and make it as effective as possible uh, another question here was how are your diagnostic and surgical techniques being used with patients with arterial venous malformations that's a very interesting question we have not used it in, in that setting um, we are working with vascular surgeons in our Department of Surgery to look at um, other uses of the technology, but to date I'm, I'm not really uh, aware of anyone using it in AV malformations. Are you, Joe? Let's see. Uh, here's actually a very <laughs> good question. You want to take this one? Um, so this question is, do patients uh, with primary lymphedema experience improvement with lymph node transfer? And if so, is this procedure as successful on primary lymphedema as it is on secondary lymphedema? Um, that's a very good question, and I wish I could answer it very concisely. But there are a couple of issues that it's, it's not so simple as primary lymphedema versus secondary lymphedema. Some patients with primary lymphedema have had lymphedema for a very long time. Um, it depends on how advanced the lymphedema is, if how much of a fluid component of the lymphedema there is that, that will respond to a lymph node transfer. So not all primary lymphedema is the same, um, and that's why it makes it difficult to compare. Some patients can have primary lymphedema because they're born with not enough lymph nodes. You'll actually see on an MR they're missing lymph nodes. Other patients have primary lymphedema, but they have a totally normal number of lymph nodes. But maybe the muscle contraction of lymphatics is not working, or maybe they're not born with enough lymphatic vessels. Um, so there's a whole spectrum of disease when it comes to primary lymphedema, and I think we're approaching primary lymphedema with particular caution. Um, we want to know the diagnosis. Um, we have done this in primary lymphedema. We haven't seen anybody get any worse in primary lymphedema. But we, because we have been very slow to, to do it in the primary lymphedema setting, we're just taking every one case by case and seeing where it makes sense. 
Do you want to add anything? Yeah, I, I, and I think it, you know, we talked about imaging and indications. Uh, I think this is an area where MR lymphangiography is going to be very helpful because we can actually see the architecture of the lymphatic system outside of the, we, we may see on a lymphocentigraphy that the, the, the system is not functioning, but why it's not functioning is really the question, and, and there's not been a surgical intervention, then there's something with the architecture. And so MR lymphangiography is, is a tool that we're looking at in this setting to try and stratify patients in terms of uh, their, the efficacy of our procedure in our hands in that patient population. And so um, this is, a, this is a, a challenging area because I, I don't even think that people physicians or scientists looking at lymphedema fully understand all the causes of primary lymphedema. There are uh, abnormalities at the cellular endothelial level, at the muscular level, as Joe said, at the lymph node level. There can be obstructions in the, um, in the major collecting ducts. There are many different aspects of, of uh, primary lymphedema and stratifying patients according to what's actually wrong with their lymphatic system is going to be key to understanding which patients are going to potentially be candidates for lymph node transfer. So great question. Thank you. Um, and we also, that being said, um, whether or not your surgical candidate were interested in looking at your lymphatic system, if you want to look at your lymphatic system and learn more about what may be causing your lymphedema, we're happy to do that. We're not, we don't need to operate. Um, we really um, want to help anybody that's interested. We, we have a lot of great questions. It's obviously a very educated um, viewing audience out there. Um, we have a, a question, can fibrosis in the limb be reversed with this procedure? And I, I think it's simple to say that uh, we don't know. Uh, honestly, we don't know. Uh, that is something we will be looking at. But truthfully, in patients who have advanced lymphedema with a lot of fibrosis, and that doesn't necessarily mean if you've had lymphedema for a long time, because you can have lymphedema for a long time and not necessarily have as much fibrosis as someone who may have had it for a shorter period of time but has had a more uh, inflammatory component to their lymphedema. So. Fibrosis is something that we're, we're, we're not sure of, and someone with very advanced stage lymphedema with a lot of fibrosis may not be the best candidate for this because they also tend to have a lot more fat deposition uh, in their extremity. Yeah. I also think there are other procedures um, for very advanced lymphedema. So in patients which we have performed where fibrosis is so severe and skin changes are so severe that they're irreversible, at that point, a debulking procedure such as removing that tissue um, becomes a possibility in combination with a lymph node transfer, which can at least give fluid an exit. But it's very case by case. Um, there, are other there are other options. That's a good point. Um, also, uh, a question regarding um, axillary web syndrome in this procedure. Uh, I'm not sure if everyone's familiar with what axillary web syndrome is. Uh, it was not well understood for many years, but I think people are, have gradually uh, come to uh, believe that axillary web syndrome uh, is basically an inflammation in the lymphatics after surgery. And it's commonly seen after axillary dissection where we see a, a cord uh, basically across the axilla that can extend down the arm. And it can be tender, tight, um, and uh, it's been associated with an increased risk of lymphedema later on. So um, we don't actually know uh, the impact of this on axillary uh, web syndrome. Um, the issue being that most of the time this resolves spontaneously, and, and it's just that is there some sort of destruction to the lymphatic uh, that occurs when this happens that subsequently makes the patient at risk. So. Um, we're not using it to treat axillary web syndrome. Um, as I said, it usually spontaneously resolves. Uh, it may take six to eight months, but it usually goes away. But um, uh, it may put a patient at increased risk for developing lymphedema afterward. Um, um, so another question is, do you recommend, uh, do you recommend compression modification after surgery, lighter is uh, lighter compression most effective? Um, it's a very, a very good question, and one um, 
in general, the first two weeks after surgery, we just want to take it easy. So light compression, because these tiny blood vessels are hooked up with, with suture uh, that's finer than a human hair, and we just don't want any compression over the area of the repair. We just want the lymph nodes to live in the first two weeks. After two weeks is out, you're kind of out of the woods. The lymph nodes are going to be fine. You can put a little pressure on them. So um, in terms of the actual compression, it's difficult. We do not, there is no standard protocol for every patient because every patient's lymphedema is not the same. Uh, what will work for some patients in terms of MLD and compression may not work for others. And so we really speak close work closely with the therapist to get a sense of how the limb is responding after such a surgery. And um, it is it is very difficult to develop a protocol that's science and data-based because it's hard to, it's really hard to study. We could study it using the, the SPY system where we can actually see the effects on the lymphatic system. But um, in general, the first two weeks we go easy on compression and then work up from there. And uh, part of our, our protocol is to um, try to optimize the limb for healing. So we, we do like patients after the two-week point to uh, sort of return to their compression routine if possible to make sure that things are going well. But often uh, the limb starts to respond and then the patients stop doing the compression. So, uh, you know, it's hard to control for that uh, entirely. But um, one of the reasons we wait one year to get the data is we want to kind of take compression out of it and we want to be at a point where we feel the healing has happened we can stop compression for a while and just see what's going on and it takes a lot of patience you know you want to see what's going on and having the spine in the office does let us do some examination sooner uh, but ultimately we want to get the one year data so that we can make apple to apple comparison between patients Anybody here in the audience have any other questions? Yes. You know, that's a very uh, practical question. And, um, you know, uh, there can be struggles with the insurance company at times. We've had patients ha have to um, um, write, and we've had to talk to medical directors. But I think, by and large, we've been successful in getting these approved. And it really comes down to explaining, taking the time to talk it through with someone who's willing to listen. And if you get a medical director on, on the phone, you can usually explain to them, this is what's going on, and do you understand what, what this means for a patient? Do you understand that you know, if they're getting infections and being hospitalized you know, every couple months, that this is not a, a, you know, a cost-effective way of managing lymphedema. And if we can do something that can improve the outcome, um, that it, it may be worth it. it it's it, a one-day hospital stay for surgery versus a two-week stay for a bad infection is, is nothing. So I think usually once we're able to discuss this with a, a medical director, someone who understands what's going on with the patients that we've been successful. Any, um, all the way in the back. Sure, that's a great question. This is um, how would a lymph node transfer impact somebody who has uh, neuropathy or blocked blood vessels or diabetes and other, you know, other medical issues. Um, it really is a case by case situation. Having diabetes does not exclude you from doing the surgery. Um, of course, you'd go through a normal medical workup and determine how risky a surgical candidate you are. If you do have a blocked vein like a DV like a DVT or a deep vein thrombosis in that arm, that needs to be evaluated by imaging. Oh, in your leg, that needs to be evaluated by imaging. And there is a possibility if the vein is really compromised that a lymph node transfer may not be effective because if the back pressure from the vein is too high, the idea of shunting fluid through the path of least resistance if you're pushing uphill it's just not, it's, it may not work. But that's something that can be evaluated with imaging. Oh. <laughs>
<laughs> lymph.org is uh, has all the information. Lymph.org is the easiest way. But I, I'll say, you know, there are patients who have swelling that are, is caused by either venous insufficiency or cardiac insufficiency, congestive heart failure. That's their lymphatic system may be totally normal, and often when you do lymph lymphocentigraphy, those patients, the lymphatic system is normal. It's just the fluid overload in the tissues. The the and that's so the the correction is not to add lymph nodes per se. It's to address the underlying cause, which is the uh, circulatory system uh, on the vascular side. Thank you. Um, yes. The question was, have we treated lymphangioma, lymphangioma circumscriptum or lymphangiomas, like, like congenital lymphangiomas? Yes, but not with lymph node transfer. Um, it's an interesting question. Lymphangiomas are congenital lymphatic malformations. Um, there are different types. Some are microcystic, consisting of very small cyst-like um, abnormalities in the lymph. Uh, vessels and in the skin, and some are macrocystic, which are large uh, types of cysts. And the, the treatments are somewhat different. Small ones can be excised. Um, larger ones often have to be sclerosed um, and then sometimes excised. Uh, unfortunately, they tend to recur. And we have not used lymph node transfer, but we have spoken with our um, vascular anomalies colleagues. Uh, we, Beth Israel, uh, slash Mount Sinai now, uh, has a, actually a very uh, world-renowned uh, vascular anomalies clinic um, headed by Francine Bly and, and uh, Alex Berenstein. And uh, they handle a large number of lymphatic malformations, and we also work with them on the surgical side. So usually we have them evaluated in the, in the vascular anomalies um, uh, program. Thank you. It's getting a little late, but if there are any other questions, uh, maybe we can answer them after afterward. 